Well, welcome. Welcome to you all. It's an absolute delight to uh, welcome you back to the second of these workshops focusing on healing um, entitled Public Health and Church Engagement Post-Pandemic. This is a, a Heart Edge workshop. Heart Edge is a, a movement, international ecumenical movement for church renewal and in the broad church especially. And we are really delighted to welcome once again uh, Gillian Strain, who is going to lead us in our second workshop, focusing on um, a theology of healing, exploring that crucial question, what is healing? Um, if you could remain on mute, that would be wonderful to help with our recording, which will be available to others after this session. And um, there will be plenty of time for your own input in breakout groups. So um, Gillian, over to you. Thank you so much once again for being with us this morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be back with you. It feels like longer than a week, I have to say. <laughs> Last week, I was just thinking, oh, it's just a week ago we did all this. Um, but it's uh, great to be back with you. And, and I'm just scanning around the screen and I, I think I recognize everyone. So I think everyone who's here now was here last week. Um, uh, but if not, that doesn't matter. I'll do a quick recap and we'll get on with the second workshop. And uh, just a quick reminder at the start, um, as Kath said, there will be breakout groups for discussion. Um, uh, and do use the chat as well if uh, you'd like to ask me a question or something's come up and do do a private message on chat if you don't want to share it with the whole group. Uh, my aim with these workshops is, is to give a lot of input and give space, but I really do want to hear questions um, and ponderings and reflections as well, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, we are learning together. You're all in your own contexts. Uh, as well. So there's a lot of group learning that's possible too. I just want to also remind you, and I know people here are very, some people are very used to this, but it's really important with the topic of health and healing uh, that sometimes um, uh, it can bring uh, up different feelings. We've all had different experiences and there's a variety of uh, approaches to healing ministry, uh, theologically and missiologically. Um, so it, uh, just to remind you, this is a, this is a safe space. We are recording this, um, uh, but do show one another respect when sharing views of, over healing. So I'm going to start my uh, PowerPoint presentation, which is, which is always a weird moment because it feels like I'm talking to myself. Um, but I shall start it and then we'll carry on and there'll be a breakout room soon. Okay, so welcome to the second workshop where uh, the topic is public health um and church engagement church engagement in a post-pandemic world um uh, and of course this is the perfect moment to be considering all this as i said last time i run a health and healing charity called the guild of health in st Raphael. i used to have to make the case constantly for the church to be engaged with health and healing and um as we continue through the pandemic that case i think has been made and uh the church as well as other faith-based organizations have been recognized as providing key help and support around health and healing during the pandemic in a practical way. And there's certainly lots of opportunities now as we open up, we're in the middle of mental health week, the mental health impact of this is huge. How can the churches be a help with this? And in what, in what ways do the church offer different types of health and healing, uh, different from the GP, different from the hospital, different from Holland and Barrett? What do we offer into the situation we're going through? So um, here we go. Last time. So what do we do last time? Um, so as I said, in order to engage well with the pandemic, we need to go back to basics uh, in order to raise our confidence to talk about health and healing in a complicated uh, landscape where you do have the doctor and other specialists you can go to. What do we offer? Uh, last time we uh, looked at the, the Christian healing ministry and in a number of different ways, I made the case that the Christian healing ministry offers more than just getting better in inverted commas. You can't see me, but I'm waving my two fingers. It's not just getting better. Christian healing ministry might include getting better, but it's also broader and deeper than that. We help people find holistic healing because it's about living deeper lives of connection. Um, and we can draw on that. And today we're going to draw out a theology of healing, um, but it's right there in the Bible on the central point of why we offer something more deep 
and more holistic and more real is that we talk about death and dying. We have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, who went through a life, who suffered, then came back from the dead in the resurrection so that we have nothing to fear. So there, healing ministry is more than getting better because we believe in the resurrection. We are about the fullness of life. We also had a look at what Christian, oh, human identity is. Um, because if we're wanting to talk about helping people to get better and to flourish, we asked the question, well, get back to what? Flourish in what way and why? Uh, the human identity is multifaceted. We have physical bodies, we have psych we psychological lives, we have spiritual lives. Um, our identity is made up of lots of different strands, including our history, our past, what we believe, what we do, um, who, we, who we live with, all sorts of different ways. And suffering impacts on all of that. So we spent a little time looking at our human identity, but also exploring our Christian identity because it is also complex. And we, each of us interweave strands um, together to build up our Christian identity, the way we um, understand Jesus' role as Lord and Savior, the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives today, what we think the Bible says, how we interpret about the Bible, the history of the church, the doctrines of the church, social ideas about being part of church and worshiping together, ideas about prayer and comp contemplation, all weave together to make up our identity as Christians. And then illness, sickness, pandemic impacts on all of that. How can we believe we are wrought in our mother's womb, as Psalm 139 says, when uh, cancer emerges in our body? Um, how can we proclaim the resurrection of Jesus from the dead when there's so much suffering around? So our suffering impacts on our identity as Christians. So it was important to explore that as well. And we looked at some of the biblical worlds around illness, wholeness and healing as well, to show that in the Bible, these words are understood in a, a, a kind of rich and complex way. You'll remember that healing, uh, the word for healing in the Bible, um, the one that you sometimes is therapio, which reminds us of the pastoral role of accompanying, of therapy, of mending. That when Jesus healed, the word he used, the, the words that are used often are used to, um, to explain inclusion and bringing somebody to safety. Um, you might also remember the word for illness has a root with the Arabic word khala, which means uh, kind of rubbing down or to get to the sweetness. So something around the biblical words for illness and healing rubs us down. And we can certainly have experienced that in our own lives. But this root, this sort of hint in the Bible, that rubbing down illness can lead to something at our core around sweetness and goodness, that there's something about getting to a great truth when we are suffering. And the word for wholeness that's often used around healing is the word shalom. Uh, which denotes that great peace um, that, that a life fully lived with God can help us to realize. And we ended with, uh, then we looked at the history of healing in the Christian church um, that's been part of our ministry from day one. Since Jesus said, go make disciples and heal, we've been engaged in it through particularly an imitation of Christ uh, to go to the sick and our ideas around the parable of the Good Samaritan, that it is our role to go to the ill. And from there blossomed and flourished the monastic communities, the hospitals in the medieval period, out of which we have our own, um, our own national health service, our own modern health service. Um, but uh, that sort of that little bell going through all of it, the little clarion call to us all, that part of being a Christian is going to the ill and, and helping them to flourish. It's part of our history and has been for a long time. And you'll also remember we have this image of the theological backpack. I love hill climbing. So we have a backpack on our way. If we're going to engage with health, public health agenda as Christians, we've got to be confident in our theology. And so I suggest you imagine you have a sort of a theological backpack with the tools you need to engage with the big questions of the day. And what we packed into our theological backpack last time was something around bodies. The Christian faith is not squeamish about bodies. They are good, they are vital, and they're never a hindrance to the faith. And importantly, um, they are not about being perfect. And, uh, and here uh, we allow um, a variety of bodies, ill bodies, sick bodies, all good in the eyes of God. And we can use our bodies, what we learn about the world through our bodies to learn about God who made them. 
because uh, the doctrine of the creation said that God made the world and it was good, including our bodies. So um, we get move away from any idea that the body is a hindrance to the spiritual life, a, a pesky little thing that gets in the way of connection with God, rejecting that and seeing the, bo the body as a way to connect in with the world and with God, even when they go wrong. And the second thing we packed was something around relationships. We are made in the image of God. And God is in relationship with God's self, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So therefore, the re relationship is at the heart of faith. And it tells us who we are and how we are to live, especially when things go wrong. So relationship, relationship with God, with our world, with our communities, and with our bodies is central to the healing ministry. And when we look at it this way, it can provoke us. It provokes us. If you think about relationship, it provokes us to care for our bodies uh, that we are in the relationship with. It provokes us to understand that flourishing is not just about ourselves. It's got something to do with how we relate to our communities. If one of us is ill, we're all ill. We are in the image of God. We, are, we relate to our communities. It provokes us to think about our world and say that none of us can have healing when there's suffering in the world. Therefore, you draw into the healing ministry and understanding of justice issues we're in relationship with God and God is love so the healing ministry is all about sharing God's love so today uh, we are going to tackle I think the giant elephant in the room uh, when you talk about healing often that elephant is miracles what do we do with miracles we can't get away from them uh, there one is at the foundation at, at, uh, of our faith um, and it becomes a bit of an obstacle for some of the conversations around health and healing. And we'll explore that. Somebody once asked me uh, in a workshop like this, do the miracles of Jesus create more problems for us than they solve? And that's, a, I think, a really nice way into talking about it. Uh, and we're going to talk about um, what the healing ministries tell us about Jesus and what they tell us about healing. And we are going towards a theology of healing by the end of this session. Uh, and so what are we going to pack in our theological backpacks today? Uh, so there we have, we've got Christology, bodies, and uh, something about relationships. We're going to look at miracles. Um, and when we talk about miracles, um, what, we, what we really need to talk about is how we know stuff, how we know anything about anything. It's really important for the faith. I live with two children and I'm constantly, why, 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 why? Um, and if you have young people, you know how, how lovely that is, but also how irritating because it comes to a point where you just have to say, well, just because, that's why. Um, but we need to sort of grab on to that child, um, that child in us all that keeps asking why. Why do we believe what we believe? Uh, because we have to, as Christians, defend the faith. Why do we think praying for people makes a blooming bit of difference? People joining me, joining today with dog collar, people without dog collars, I bet you've said once in your life, can I pray for you? What do we think we mean? What do we think is going to happen? How do you defend the faith? Um, how do you defend the church as being a place for health and healing? And that all comes down to how you explain what you believe. How do we know stuff? How do we defend stuff? And the fancy word for that is epistemology. Um, and I love the field of epistemology. I do a lot in science and religion. It's all about how do you know stuff? So you might have heard of the philosopher David Hume, and he came up with this his sort of image. It's a, really, it's a story about a turkey. Uh, it's called the inductivist turkey. So a turkey, you know, got up every day, had breakfast, sun came up, had breakfast, had a great day, went to bed. And as far as a turkey was aware, that was uh, what happened every single day. He got up, the sun rose, he ate some food, had a great day, went to bed. And then he got to Christmas Eve and things were different on Christmas Eve. And so the turkey had applied the, the theory of inductive knowledge. He decided that he knew about the world based on what had happened the day before and it never changed. And you can see the problem with an inductive way of thinking. That's one way of thinking. That's one way, one epistemology. That's one way of knowing stuff. Just seeing what happened the day before and thinking, well, it'll be the same today. So there's a scientific method, which is a way that science knows stuff, looks at the world, makes a theory, tests the theory, it sticks for a while until another theory comes along, and that knowledge is held within a community. That's a scientific method. But there's other ways of knowing stuff. A great chemist philosopher called Polensky 
uh, Michael Polensky, he talked about intuitive knowing, the stuff of the gut. Now, this man was a chemist, a philosopher, you know, he did hardcore science, but he also talked in science about gut knowing. And his great phrase was, we know more than we can tell, that kind of deep subconscious knowing. And in faith knowing, how do we know stuff in the faith? What is our epistemology? Well, something to do with the Bible, something to do with our history, tradition, reason, contemplation, and maybe mystical stuff as well. So that is all draws together into that fancy word epistemology, that is vital for us. If we want to talk about health and healing, we need to be able to defend the faith and talk about what we're going. So we're going to do that today and get towards a healing theology. So let's talk about miracles. So most, uh, I love, actually, I don't like this image, but you know, it's there, it's provocative. Most people think that's what the healing ministry is around, uh, what the healing ministry is about. Um, and this isn't a flippant. I just want to tell a quick story before I get any further. I have a friend and he, he lets me tell the story. He's ordained. Um, he was ordained at the same time as me. He walks with two sticks. He survived a benign tumor on his spine, became paralyzed, then taught himself to walk again. And he walks, he's quite visibly disabled. He walks with two sticks. And he said, he told the story that when he was in the basement of a cathedral somewhere about to get ordained deacon, someone said to him, I can't believe they're ordaining you. You're so obviously still sinful. So this idea, and I can see a few people shaking their heads. Um, this, this is not a theoretical, let's talk about miracles stuff. This, we're talking about miracles because the th poor theology around sin, sickness, and getting better harms lives today. And I could quite literally start a whole new charity, which just heals, which <laughs> we just heal bad healing ministries because a lot of damage is done. So miracles is often the elephant in the room. Um, and, and we can, that's a very extreme story, but I'm sure, and you may have similar stories, but this, um, this poor understanding of miracles or, or the way we talk about miracles leads to other negative experiences that are perhaps not so dramatic. I spend a lot of my life talking about the healing ministry and most people are kind of positive and interested, but I do meet negativity or difficult reactions sometimes. There's three different types of negative reaction I might get. The first is, well, why, why would I go to church? I can go to the doctors. What is the point of you? Ambivalence. Sometimes I get anger. Well, you know, I, you prayed for my gran, but she still died. What do you think you're doing? It didn't work. Mm, what's that about? And another one, so I often talk about cancer because I am a cancer survivor. I get people who are desperate. Whatever magic wand you have, can you wave it? And that's kind of heartbreaking one as well because this, that comes from a real place of desperation. So with my, my friend's story and all these kind of ambivalent reactions, uh, and I'm sure you have your own stories. And if we were in a room together, we could share, um, but let's crack on. F what, we, what we do with miracles is at the heart of quite a lot of those negative responses. And so let's spend some time thinking about miracles. There are so many of them in the Bible. And of course, our entire faith is founded on the miracle of the resurrection. Um, and, uh, and I think that there are many obstacles for people that to stop people coming to church. Um, and miracles is a key one because people believe you've got to choose between the doctors and church, between science and religion. And there's a lot of um, negative feelings towards the church. Um, people believing that, well, we just believe in miracles like you see in that picture. That's what we believe. That's mumbo jumbo, I'm not going. Um, so there's quite a lot of unpacking we need to do around that um, uh, negative attitude that people might have towards what we believe around miracles. Um, and let me just, another provocative slide. Um, so Richard Dawkins, sometimes called one of the horsemen of the of new atheism. I think new atheism's kind of moved on since Richard Dawkins, but he still comes up a lot when people think about the church and think about religion. He's sometimes called the grand high priest of atheism. So here he says, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the rising of Lazarus, even the Old Testament miracles, all are frequently used for religious propaganda and they are very effective with an audience of unsophisticates and children. 
Uh, so, you know, typically polemical, um, typically derogatory of people who are, are of a faith, Sunday school level understanding of what the church believes. So I'm not, you know, even beginning, you know, to waste time talking any further about what Richard Dawkins says. Um, but the important thing is that lots of people believe that believe what he says, believe that you have to choose. And um, we actually uh, have a PR job more than anything else um, in order to um, counter this type of thing. Um, and as I talk about miracles now, I thought I'd put up a slightly more positive take. I love um, this from the present Pope, Pope Francis. Miracles happen, but prayer is needed. A prayer that is courageous, struggling and persevering, not prayer that is a mere formality. And I love it because it's, it's, it displays the tension of talking about healing and miracles. Um, because miracles do happen, I would say I've seen miracles, I've experienced miracles, tiny, tiny little ones that I can't explain any other way. Uh, but I've also found healing through, you know, lots of cytotoxic chemicals and chemotherapy and psychology and through faith, you know, what's a miracle there? You know, it's an ambiguous area, what it is. Um, but they are an inescapable part of the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition. The founding stories of the Jewish people record God sending miraculous plagues to convince the Egyptians of God's power. When Moses led eventually the people to the promised land, it was via the miraculous parting of the Red, tea, Red Sea. So too, in the New Testament accounts, Jesus regularly highlighting his divinity through the working of supernatural wonders, so, such as turning water into wine or healing the sick or bringing the dead to back to life. And of course, our entire faith is grounded in the miracle of the resurrection. And miracles didn't, according to the Bible, stop there. The early evangelism and mission of the apostles sent out by Christ, we're reading through it at the moment, uh, involve miracles such as Peter's escape from the book of Acts. So what are miracles? By definition, they are displays of supernatural power, acts of God, which happen over and above the general laws of nature as they are understood. Uh, so that's what they are. How are they understood? For the faithful, they can be the revelation of a supreme and all-powerful God. And many people still expect them to occur today as a result of prayer. So how do we understand the miracles? Some theologians would say they are a necessary part of revelation to creation, to God showing us God. Others more generally show that they show God's glory in the world to encourage faith and to guide people on their Christian journey, whether as part of an everyday faith or something which only happened in the past and that tension still exists. Do they still happen or is it just something in the past? Others might argue that the miracles in the Bible are a result of a lack of scientific understanding of the world. They just didn't understand. So they just said, well, that's God. And then used as a propaganda machine of the early church. So I'm going through here all the different views of miracles. I'm not saying what I think. This, so this is the, this is the land. So this is what people think. And in the discussion groups, we'll, we'll have a chat about it. And today, some Protestant and Reformed churches are less enthusiastic about the place of miracles in the modern world. Um, although parts of the church, particularly around the charismatic renewal uh, denominations, claim that both miraculous healing and speaking in tongues are gifts of the Holy Spirit manifested in worship today. So some thinking just in the past, some thinking ah, poor science, others expecting them Sunday at 10 o'clock. In the Roman Catholic Church, the Congregation of the Causes of Saints, a wonderful title, I think, for a, a, an office, assesses modern day miracles as part of the process of canonizing saints. It's a long procedure which takes into account eyewitness reports and clinical examinations in the event of a miraculous healing. For example, the miracle aiding Mother Teresa's uh, elevation was um, the um, apparent miraculous healing of a cancerous tumor in an Indian woman. So why are miracles tricky for us Christians, apart from, you know, how you identify them or how you think of them in the past? The problem of miracles is also theological. If we choose to believe God intervenes randomly, uh, what do we think God's up to? If we say miracles are possible, that's a random intervention of the divine. Why are we saying this happened? Is it to show his supremacy? Is it to show that that person is particularly holy? And 
does this approach raise problems for us? Because what that approach might display is a rather selective God, a God which either intervenes randomly or intervenes if somebody's really holy. Is it just, is it just uh, selective or is it capricious? And if we base our faith in God and these happenings on our own day, the question for us might be, are we not then treading on shaky ground? If we say there, that was definitely a miracle, but next week some scientist says, well, actually it was this and I can prove it. Have we not risked our faith? Uh, and these questions which emerge from the idea of miracles remind us of the tension of holding both a scientific view of the world and an active Christian faith. It's a really tense place. What do you do? How do you explain what you see around you? And that's why I think with our theological backpacks, our imaginary backpacks, we also need to pack it in some way, and we work this out for ourselves, some way to deal with this ambivalence and tension, some way to deal with uncertainty. I don't know how you pack that. Is that actually a thing? It's an attitude, a way. How do you deal with uncertainty, with the not knowing? Because any discussion of miracles, and indeed any theistic discussion about science and religion comes down to the degree to which you believe God interacts with the world. How much does God interact with the world? That's at the heart of discussions around scientific science and religion and at the heart of our discussion and miracles. If God's all powerful, then it's a truism to say that miracles are possible. God can do what God wants. But as God is limited to the laws of nature, then belief in miracles might become a little bit trickier. So we're back to how do you believe the stuff you believe? How do you hold that tension between a belief in science and a belief in God? How do you work out that uncertainty? And then how do you defend the faith? That's a question for us. So uh, let's go into discussion groups, if that's okay, Ben. And um, here, let's um, spend maybe um, until quarter past, uh, quarter past 11, I spent good 15 minutes in this because quite a lot of, in this, I think. Um, are miracles explanations of people who lack our scientific understanding or do they reveal the power of God? First question. Ben's going to put these in the chat too. Did they only happen in the past or do you think they happen today? Are you happy? So this, I mean, happy seems a flippant word, but this, it's really important. You know, this is about to what degree can you defend the faith with an approach to miracles, which is clear. God does or does not intervene? Or do you prefer a more ambivalent approach? And finally, when thinking about healing that some are describing as a miracle, what, to what extent can you use it to promote the faith? So four questions there. We have 15 minutes and take your whole selves and your whole knowledge, take your theological backpack to this discussion. What do you know about the Bible? What's been your experience most importantly? And we have to 15 minutes, uh, have 15 minutes. Thanks, Ben. Right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, 15 minutes of miracles. I'm sure you sorted, sorted it all out. Uh, that's great. So sorry, it's so quick. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's such an interesting discussion. Uh, so my point of view is that miracles are possible. I've had uh, experiences. Um, there is much that we can't explain. <clears throat> I often say in the healing ministry, these things take time, as the Pope also said, um, and we don't have a God's eye view, view on it uh, as well. Um, what I think is almost uh, as important is, uh, is our understanding of science in all of this. Um, and uh, science has often a very rationalistic or is understood to have a very rationalistic view of nature. Um, but there's been a move, particularly in the last 10 years, to expand the kind of the way that science examines the world. So um, expanding science epistemological approach particularly in the fuzzy areas, fuzzy areas of science, things like quantum mechanics, consciousness. Um, scientists themselves have also, are now beginning to say, hmm, we need to change what uh, information we're looking at in order to best understand the world. Faith's already know, always known this, right? Uh, you take lots of different ideas in order to come up with understandings of the world. But science now is saying, actually, 
we need to engage in the world in a more broad way. And I just want to really quickly share uh, three good thinkers in this area, if this is something you want to look at as well. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, so the first is Professor Marcelo Gleiser, who won the Templeton Prize uh, last year. Um, <clears throat> he's an American, South American uh, thinker, a physicist, hardcore physicist, a cosmologist, and he imagines science as an island, and and the 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 boundary, the board, the boundaries, the uh, borders, the, the shoreline of the island is what we don't know. It's that engagement with the unknown, and the more we know, the bigger the island gets, the longer the coastline. Science is constantly progressing into the unknown. And just by taking that sense, Professor Gleiser opens up conversations with philosophy, with faith. He's an agnostic himself, but a really interesting approach. I'd highly recommend his book, Island of Knowledge. Uh, Nancy Cartwright um, has got an interesting text called The Dappled World um, from the Gerald Manley Hopkins poem. This idea that in the world, in our experience, there are pools of life, pools of knowledge, pools of understanding of how the world works. So if you're a scientist looking at how balls roll down hills, you, your pool of light is Newtonian mechanics. But if you're looking at the subatomic world, your pool of light is quantum mechanics, what goes on there. And you know what, the Newton mechanics, quantum mechanics, they, they, they don't agree with each other. So they are pools of areas and, and the, 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 the knowledge we draw into the world through our faith in God is another pool of light, the dappled world approach. So I'd highly recommend her. And Tom McLeish, you might've heard of him. He's a reader in the Church of England. He's a professor up at York University, a uh, fantastic speaker. And um, he, his recent book is The Role of the Imagination in the creative, creativity involved in science and the creativity involved in making music. You know, he's, sort of, he's gone around and talked to uh, scientists and, and said, you know, tell me about your eureka moment. When did it happen? How did it happen? How, did, how does scientific creativity work? And how is that? Oh, it's the same as other kinds of creativity. So another really interesting speaker there. Uh, and if you want following up with references, just drop me an email. Um, so let's go on. What did Jesus say about healing? So what did Jesus do around healing? And let's talk about that because he almost did this. He did this more than anything else, right? He did teaching, he did feeding the 5,000, he did stuff, but he mostly did teaching. Some, some days I analyzed it, given a percentage, um, but he mostly did healing. So what does it tell us first about Jesus? And what does it tell us about healing? So two different topics and you will be familiar with so many of the stories um the healing of the woman with hemorrhages man lowered from the roof my favorite one gerasim demonia they're part of the lectionary they're part of our bread and butter right they are just we have them all the time let's let's think about them some theologians just to mention quickly then move on to scout them as real events oh they were just propaganda they were just um they weren't didn't really happen they were just sort of spiritual or cultural events uh, most of the academy rejects that view, right? There's, they don't make sense, the healing miracles of Jesus, unless they actually happened. The leper was actually healed, so he could actually go to the temple again. These are not psychological events, they were real events, and let's treat them as such. So first of all, what do they tell us about Jesus? Three areas. They tell us about his relationship with the Father, God the Father, that's the cosmological stuff, fancy word. They demonstrate his power to save, soteriological stuff. Oh, I've got them in a different order on my screen, sorry. And they tell us uh, that the time is here, eschatological stuff so there, that somehow the healing miracles are revealing um, something important in the timeline of our relationship with God. So the first one, the third, first one there, the ontological. That's right, ontological. Yes, that's the key. So the first one there, they had the compassion of God. So remember the context. We talked about this a bit last time. The context of being sick in the time of Jesus. It wasn't just that they were sick and things hurt and parts of their body didn't work. It was much more than that. Being sick in the time of Jesus meant exclusion and it meant poverty. Um, often the sick had limited access to the temple. Uh, couldn't work, they suffered stigma. Uh, and so when they were healed, they were made better, inverted commas, but they were also restored to life in a much fuller way. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, in the gospel healing miracles, only once does, um, does Jesus 
the somebody named get healed the healing of blind bartimaeus uh, most of the other gospel stories drop the name in that way we can understand these healings to be universalized they're about in general people who are sick and stigmatized and excluded being brought back into life and um if we look at sort of what jesus was actually doing it, it wasn't like he was walking along and there was laser beams coming out of his hands in a random sort of way jesus saw the person saw the suffering you know that story we had last week of the woman touching his hem of the cloak he noticed he turned around in mark one the healing of the leper the leper says if you will you can make me clean jesus says i want there was a will to help a kind of heart connection right he was moved by compassion it says in luke 7 when he healed the widow of nair and there wasn't just oh i'm just going to show i'm god this was deep links the compassion of god was shown in the miracles of jesus so the second thing uh they showed that he was the one they were waiting for so throughout the history of the jewish people um there was an expectation that the messiah would come and that things would happen in general when the messiah came things like graves would be opened uh powerful rulers would be toppled and healings was part of that so and particularly in mark's gospel there is a sense of the time is here, the time is being fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near in the way that was predicted um, through Isaiah and the other prophets. The miracles of the last days, as uh, Isaiah wrote, um, would include hearing miracles, also struggle with evil. Uh, we see that particularly in the Mark and Gospels, healing stories, that there was uh, some tackling of the devil and, and, and uh, bad spirits in order uh, for people to find healing all um, part of the eschatological um, expectation of Jesus, uh, including the proclamation of John, are you the one who is to come? These healings show a breaking in of the kingdom of God into that time. Um, and finally, that this man has power. Uh, he had power of God to heal. Um, and, and it wasn't just, again, making better. It was an idea of restoration. Of, of, of healing of healing of the sins, restoring the person to power, to the full inclusion of, in the community. And in that way, he taught what healing was through the miracles. Um, and, and these were associated with the words that he says. So that's what we learned about Jesus from the healing miracles. The one he's been waiting for showed the compassion of God and the power of God to restore people to the fullness of life, to, the, to something that they were supposed to have been. We'll get into more of that later. And what do we learn about the healing miracles, about healing from the healing miracles? First, um, again, first, um, it was about re-entering the community. People often excluded, the, uh, as I said before, it was more than getting better. But also these weren't sort of, they weren't often, you know, just private things. The, the community observed, community saw what was going on. The, in Mark 5, the witnesses were overcome with amazement. These were community events. Um, that were happening, not private things. It was part of the global he healing. It wasn't just a private thing. It was a global thing in the presence of Jesus. Um, and often uh, then with the healing, people were able to enter the community. The taboo was uh, erased. And so it was about that individual, but also as well about the culture of how the healthy interpreted having to live with the sick. The ill, were, the ill were healed and allowed to re-enter into community, thus um, removing the taboo at that time, removing the oppression, removing being sidelined, removing the psychological suffering of being ill. And that was all swept up in the healing as they were re-entered into community. Um, and often associated with forgiveness. There's, in the history of the healing ministry, there has been at times an overemphasis on, uh, on sin and illness. Um, so much so that illness was 100% uh, uh, re related to sin. And this is at the root of much poor healing ministry. Why didn't your prayers work? Well, you're still sinful. Rubbish. Um, but we cannot dispense entirely with this connection between this um, between uh, illness and, and sin. And we know that within the, the sacramental um, uh, the sacrament of confession, the power of uh, speaking out what's gone wrong and hearing forgiveness and how maybe in our own lives when we, we have either gone through sacramental confession or spoken about something that's really difficult, we do feel better. So at a psychological level, we can say that there's something going on. 
but it also denotes more importantly that a fullness of life uh, flourishing with God is something to do with admitting our distance from him, uh, admitting our distance from God so that we're released from his power over us. So healing is about physical, it is about mental, but it is about that psychological way that when we mess up, it makes us feel bad and it distances us from God. So that, as Rowan Williams says, what healing is really about is the restoration of relationship, including in, into the community and what he wrote as the bridging of a gulf between spirit and alienated flesh. It's about that whole person approach to getting better. It's demonstrated by Jesus healing through the inclusion, the taking away of the taboo, but also dealing with the psychological alienation of just being on this side of heaven, right? So let's quickly break into our, healing, our groups again. And um, I want to explore the healing. You know, I, I thought, well, we could just look at a healing story in the Bible and that's fine and valuable. Uh, but I want to do it slightly differently. I, I, you received through email a couple of healing stories and these are shared with me with through um, friends and colleagues, people. I got people just to tell their story of healing. And I was blown away by the stories I've got. They're anonymized, I'm allowed to share them. And there's some uh, dis discussion of um, bipolar disorder, if that's a trigger for anyone, just for people to look after themselves. But these are stories I said, tell me about your, your Christian spiritual healing. And these were the stories I got back. Um, so let's look at these stories and take maybe 10 minutes to discuss these stories. What do they tell us about healing? In what way do they relate to the gospel healing stories? And uh, which healing story are you drawn to or most interested in and why? So we'll come back in uh, 10 minutes, please. And then we'll be looking at uh, working out a theology of healing. Oh, welcome back, everyone. That looks like us. Would anybody be willing just to share something from their discussion, from the stories, and and how and how it made you think about healing, or and if they relate at all to the healing healing miracles in the in the gospels? It'd be great if anyone wanted to share something, because I feel like it's just been me this entire time talking. Thank you, Karen. We thought the second. We thought the second. The second one was very uh, blameful, um, and not a very positive thing. Not very helpful to people. And the first one was very um, accepting and using. You know, it was, a, it was a a mesh of God, but in a positive way, and coping with what was going on and using it. Mm. And also the. Um, in the gospel, it's very simplistic. When 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 the miracles are described, it's very simplistic, and you don't know what the surrounding story is or would be, and you know, sort of what take will, will be will be made with with that whole story if it was a whole story. Mm. Thank you. The first story, um, we thought that it was a process um, that um, the occurrences were. A healing process throughout the story um, which was very different from um, the second story but the first one um, definitely I thought was like that okay thank you thank you Jackie any other reflection from perhaps a different group okay we will crack on then Thank you for sharing. I'm going to share my screen. So we're going to try to work some of this, all of this, into a theology of healing. So we've got our backpacks on, we've got something about bodies, about relationships, about miracles. And one of the key things I think, in, in, to try to coalesce some of this, is, is to, to find a theology of healing that, that entangles, the Bible says, what our experience of the world is, what our understanding of the problem is, um, in order to um, help our churches and to help us as individuals go around this world where people get sick and the pandemic continues to con go on. But yet we believe in God and believe that somehow it helps. So we're going to try and collate, just sort of draw that all into a theology of healing. Uh, so, 
And we're going to use three main bits. You tell I used to be a scientist. So let's set it all out. But we're going to mix together, like chemistry experiment, three different test tubes. So in one test tube, we're going to put in uh, what do we believe health is? Okay, and that'll tell us what the problem is we're, we're trying to solve. So what is health? We're going to add in, what is the experience of suffering? Like what is the problem we're trying to solve when we talk about Christian spiritual healing? And we're going to add in our faith uh, as well. So that, three, that third one's quite big, uh, but we'll have a go. And I've got a, a definition to, um, to uh, show you at the end. And it'd be good to have some questions at the end. Michael, thank you for already sending a question. Any other questions, stick them on chat. So let's start defining uh, healing uh, by thinking about what first is health. It seems so obvious, but it, when it's, I get all these things. When you start to go into it, it becomes more complicated. So what is health? Well, the World Health Organization, you think they'd know, um, says that health is this. This is a definition it came up with in 1948 and it hasn't changed. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. Complete physical, mental and social well-being. Well, first of all, is that even possible? Can anyone ever say <laughs> that they have this? Um, this sounds a bit like, I might suggest to you, what we hope happens when we get to heaven like complete physical, mental and social well-being. Um, also, it misses, as soon as they published this, you know, the day after, you know, it was pointed out that this is missing a really key thing. It's not missing spiritual well-being. Yet it remains. Here is a definition of health from the Healing and Wholeness Council 1990. It's quite, it's old now, right? But I think it's still quite good. They, they stated it is a dynamic state of well-being of the individual and society, of physical, mental, spiritual, economical, political, and social well-being, of being in harmony with each other and with the environment and with God. And you can perhaps see why that's better. It's dynamic. It's changing all the time. Our health, and our health changes all the time. It's got to do with us, but everything else as well. And it's got to do with our relationship, back to that relationship thing, with ourselves, with the world, and with God. So I think that's pretty good, but I want to throw in this, this other one too, a uh, bit more radical um, and it's provocative and I like it for that. Health is the strength to live, the strength to suffer and the strength to die. Health is not a condition of my body, it's the power of my soul to cope with varying degrees of that body. And here this Jürgen Mollman, he's just blasted out of the water, hasn't he? Health is not something you get with some pills, or an operation, um, it is the strength to live. So, uh, and the power of your soul. So they say, well, you can have health even if your body is collapsing, even if you're mentally ill, because health is simply the power to carry on loving and doing the work, work of God. And I think that's what we're talking about really, when we talk about healing and health in the church, we're helping people do that in the name of Christ. So that's health. Um, and this is what we're sort of the biblical background of all of this. And it's really hard to summarize what help people get back to. It's informed by everything, so much in the Bible, particularly the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. So, uh, so let's think about that, um, that uh, what you, apologetic angle. So what do us in this workshop today, what do we want to tell people about uh, the healing power of Christ. I was asked this week to provide a quotation about preaching, <laughs> preaching and healing in a time of pandemic. And one of the questions was, you know, how can we make our preaching on healing better? And I said, and I, my response was, you've got to talk to people who don't come to church because they're, they're the important ones in a way. They're the mission field. They're the people we need to understand in order to communicate well what we're on about. And here's a, there's four different quotations I think we need to be, you know, getting out on the street. This is what we're doing. We are saying that nothing can separate you from the power of love of God and Christ Jesus as our Lord. Nothing life can throw at you. Death, life, angels, rulers, things, presence, things to come, powers, heights, death. Nothing can separate you from love of God. What a message for people right now. Do not be afraid, said Jesus. Fear grips so many people. The belief that they're not worth anything grips most people. 
That's the greatest problem today, self-doubt. We've got an answer for that. Come, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. There's something in our churches, in our healing ministry that will satisfy not just that broken leg or that broken relationship or that cancer cell that's multiplying, but satisfied our deep need never to be alone and hungry again. And uh, Revelation 22, and this is, we offer the, the kind of, we talked earlier today about the, the timeline of God. We talk about the world to come as well, because we talk about death and resurrection in the healing ministry. And we talk about this. This is what we're going towards, the river of the water of life, bright as a crystal flowing from the throne of God in the middle of the street of the city. The river is the tree of life, 12 crimes of fruit producing fruit in each month and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Right, this is not just about you or me or communities. This is about the justice and the whole world. So we need to get this and take it in our theology of healing as well. So what have we done? We've got what is health? We've got this is our faith. And what are we helping people? What's the, what's the issue? What's the suffering we're talking about? Uh, so much uh so uh i sometimes give the example um uh, of, of um I, I once broke my leg i fell down the stairs broke my leg uh it didn't change my life it taught me a lot like wear slippers um but it didn't change my life but i had cancer and it did change my life and why is it this is sort of a summary of a book i wrote it did change my life and it changed my life because the suffering of cancer changed who i was fundamentally it changed my view about the world, about God, about friendship, about relationship, about my body. It changed me. Um, and so the healing from cancer was about relearning who I was again. And Simone Va was a French philosopher and she puts it more, more beautifully. She talks about uh, suffering and affliction. She, she says um, that, if, that affliction is what Jesus went through on the cross. Affliction for her was physical suffering, psychological suffering and social suffering. Physical suffering for Jesus, obviously on the cross. Psychological suffering, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Social suffering, he was isolated. Deep, multifaceted suffering leaves a trace upon one's soul. And this is what we are bringing, to, bringing the healing ministry to. We're not just for healing broken legs. We're not just for you know, healing bits and bobs. We are helping people find out, helping them get over deep suffering that causes them to doubt who they are, suffering that's left a trace upon their souls and help them get back to the state that we believe um, God has for them, life to flush her. So we, let's, let's crush all that together. Oh, crush is not a good word. Let's put it all together. And this is my working theology of healing. Christian healing does not necessarily mean getting better, but is an experience which leads to holistic positive change in self-identity and an increase in well-being. It's a transformational experience in which the ill or everyone are reconciled with their status as beloved children of God when they resonate with God's love and find peace. Part of the transformation might be a sense that we see the world anew, that we have new vision, that we have new purpose. It is a life giving transformation, which leads to a reframing of circumstance. Healing is about reconciliation and human flourishing. And the word flourishing is one that, um, I think it's fantastic and really describes what we're trying to do. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you'll know, was a prisoner of war and gave his life. And he wrote in one of his books um, that Christian flourishing is less about the pursuit of health at all costs and more about fulfilling the purpose of our lives. Health is good, health is often needed to do a whole host of work, but health needs to be placed in a scatological perspective. Health is the penultimate goal not the ultimate one. So for him, Christian flourishing is about finding the health and healing. But there he makes the next leap that I think is so vital when we talk about Christian healing. He writes, it's about fulfilling the purpose of our life. It is about vocation. It is finding whether we're lay or ordained, whatever it is, is finding what God is calling us to do and what God is calling us to be. That's why when we talk about healing, what I think we're really investigating is how to live. It's about identifying what it means to be hu human. It's about living in bodies that sometimes go wrong. And it's about how we respond to such situation. 
um, that these, the, 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 this, how we respond to these situations and the healing opportunities that they give us to, to deepen our relationship with God, to do God's work and to become holy. Uh, so that's the sort of end of my presentation. Um, it'd be great to have any questions or feedback. We've actually had a question in already. I'm just going to stop sharing uh, that way so I can see everyone. Uh, so I think it, Michael asked a really good question. He said, Gillian, uh, perhaps um, you could address a person who has experienced a miracle being acknowledged for their faith and someone not being healed then being accused of a lack of faith? And this is a really important question. So somebody who um, uh, is celebrating the fact that they're, they're, um, they've got better because they prayed and somebody else who's not, being, who's not being healed and then being accused of lack of faith. And you know, this is really a pastoral issue. Um, and there's two different, I think, levels of response. I think there's a response first to that individual who has not been healed. And, but we have to you know, insert the word apparently not being healed as well. Um, and we can come up with lots of clever theological answers. We could talk about uh, the, um, the, the um, what do you call it, ontology of God or all these different things. But the first pastoral response in that situation, I would suggest is you listen to that person and let them be really angry about what's going on in their life and give them space to tell their story. Um, and, you know, the Bible is full, of, especially the Psalms of people railing against God. And Jesus himself, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me, says Jesus. Um, he apparently wasn't able um, to connect in at that moment of suffering. So it's okay for us to rail and to be angry when things apparently haven't gone wrong. And then perhaps more gently, um, get them to unpick what they mean by it's not worked. I bet there's lots of little bits of healing that might be going on with our family, with the wider situation. Suggest perhaps a miracle of medicine and, and what they're going through and, and all the other opportunities, but mostly give them space. I think the ill get told what to think so often, they get told how to behave, how to be. Um, but instead, as a pastor, as a Christian listener, somebody just saying you know how are you and listen to the answer and let them tell their own story in their own words there might be a bigger bit of work the second pastoral issue is around the community or the other people that are saying you know you have not prayed hard enough it's your fault your sin is still there what have you done to deserve this all the things i've heard personally said to me around illness um and uh some really important teaching to be done there about um what, uh, what's going on, that God is present at all times, even when people are suffering, God is present. And in, in a way, open up a space for the people who are accusing that person of lack of faith. And what is it in them that needs, that means that they are accusing that person of lack of faith? What is, what fears are around for them? Why do they need God to be demonstrated um, through a prayer coming true for that person um, so often we like dualistic thinking black and white thinking we like to say um, I'm definitely good with God because my prayers come true and so when people are accusing others of a sinfulness around health and healing it might say much more about them than than anything else and their need for answers as well so I'm just going to look at the, I'll do that difficult thing of chairing but looking at the chat at the same time so um if anyone has any questions, just turn your mic on and speak. Any questions? When I was ill with cancer, I remember being in the chemotherapy suite um, and an, an older lady came up. I was in Scotland, it's a bit more conservative up there. And, um, and she held my hand and she said, oh dearie, you're so young, I'm so old, what have you done to deserve this? And, um, and it's always stayed with me. And I know, she, and at the time I said, oh, you know, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> uh, um, but um, and I know she's being kind and I probably, probably wouldn't react any differently now, but it really bothered me and it stayed with me for years because she was saying so many things in that sentence. I mean, she, she was 
she was reaching out, she was touching, she was being kind, that was nice. But um, she was sort of saying something like, well, I'm old and I sort of deserve all this, but it was, it's, and you're young and you must have, uh, and, I, and it's, it was so damaging in so many different ways because um, I may, it made me wonder, it said a lot about her, the, her theology perhaps, um, but it also made me um, feel really guilty about being ill, as if I had any control over how my cells were multiplying in my body. And, um, and this often happens around the war metaphor for cancer, you know, she fought a good battle, she lost the war, all the rest of it, as if we've got any kind of control over what, what it is, what, what, whether the treatment works or not. And so the ill are often left where, with a burden of guilt to deal with as well as whatever else they're going through. And so choice of language is really important. And I've done quite interesting work with other cancer people um, and, and what metaphors they use and how they talk about their cancer and how they talk about their experience with illness. And, and there's a lot of pastoral value in letting people just explore that for themselves. Uh, and I've heard people say, well, they, they talk to their cancer. Um, other people, they sort of, they, well, they prefer sort of the gardening metaphor. Um, that you know they're part of nature and this is just what nature is doing with them so there's all sorts of different things we can do when we talk to people who are ill um, but of course particularly good to have your ears pricked up for is any sort of um, dualistic thinking and and often um, people when people respond to the ill in a negative way and want to say well it's just about faith and sin it, it's really more about their fears than anything else and certainly in my experience of being ill and looking ill. I remember going to somewhere and they're like, oh, hi, Julian, you're looking so well. <laughs> and I really didn't, I was bald. I looked terrible. Um, but from that I was saying, sorry, I, I, don't want to I don't want to hear your story. You're too much in this situation. And um, either socially or within the medical system, the ill so often don't get a chance to speak. They're just, they're just their diagnosis or they're, they create uncomfortableness in a room. So as for pastoral ministry, helping just the person to tell the story is so important and can be so healing. Catherine. That reminded me about um, what was so powerful about the two stories we've just looked at in the group is that they, they were personal stories recounted by those people themselves. And yet in the gospel narratives, I was, I, I'd never thought of it before, but actually we're not hearing the, the voice of the people who have been healed directly and I was imagining what those stories might be in comparison to your two case studies um, but so often people outside of the church say you know why is there suffering why why you know where are the miracles if you believe in God and maybe we need to share more um, uh, courageously the stories of finding strength in the suffering you know that 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 deeply inspire us you know how can in the church should we perhaps be sharing more of the stories of finding the, the personal stories not speaking on behalf of others but you, you know amplifying the voices of those of us who are suffering and finding life and wholeness in that suffering we should be amplifying that voice more just a thought Yes, I agree, Catherine. There's a lot. There's a lot of good literature out there. Kate Bowler is a good person as well. Um, she talks about long-term health health issues and how she copes with it. And there's also a need, I think, for sort of the radical. You know, I was talking. So we just released a good podcast on um, the Go Health website with John Stackhouse, who's a Canadian theologian. And um, his I, I, and I was I, I I was saying, oh no, how do we help people talk about illness and suffering, all the rest of it, and. Um, and I, I, I do this quite a lot. And I said, my, you just heard what I say, so open up the support stories for the suffering. And he did a slightly different approach that I found really good and it's helped me change my approach. He said his wife had been diagnosed with chronic um, back, I think it was back pain. And, um, and they're both committed Christians. And she's, you know, and, and her approach is that she now lives within a disabled body, but is carrying on. She doesn't want it to define her whole conversation every day. Her mission is to carry on loving and living each day, but with chronic pain that she doesn't ever expect to end. Some days are worse than others. But there's something about the how radical it is when our magazine shelves are full of beautiful bodies um, being perfect to say, well, actually, I'm going, I've got a body that's breaking down or broken down or a bit rubbish. And here, here we are in the middle of Mental Health Awareness Week as well. Yet I still can live. Um, and make an impact in the name of Christ with whatever's going on in our body. So it's sort of, I agree with you, Catherine, but it's taking kind of, you know, uh, living with the tension that yes, things go wrong, but we can, we still got stuff to do. 
as well. And um, certainly I've been really influenced by death at deathbeds when people are dying, but at peace, you know, their body is failing in, in, in the final way. And yeah, they're still experiencing, they're still proclaiming love and connection and displaying healing. Um, also, there's a thought I had that it's very important not to judge things too quickly. Mm. Um, and because things have a habit of working out and they should be allowed to, instead of um, making a judgment on something which is not necessary mm. on people. Mm. Yes, you're right, Jackie. And also, and the harm that can be done as well to add to whatever problems yeah. we have, the harm that can be done by judging too early as well. I was um, where I used to live, there was an, a very um, conservative evangelical community. One of their number got a brain tumor and was dying rapidly. A young guy, it was really, really, really difficult. And they immediately started praying for his healing. And I was part of it and I was really positive. And it was connecting with God, but creating solidarity. But it didn't appear to work in inverted commas very quickly. And that was hugely challenging for some people in the group. Um, and then the thing spiraled. It was really, it was really, really difficult to spiral. And, you know, the parents were accused of not reconciling with their son. The doctors, the nurses being accused of not being, I mean, it just, it just exploded. And we had to get, um, other leaders to intervene and get it under control because people were so fixated on like an economic model of prayer like we will pray and we will get we will obtain this miracle against all odds but it didn't work and then you see everything everything was just crumbling everything else was crumbling because they weren't able to make this this and that's a really extreme example but the theological problems are the same karen got a hand up yeah i was just wondering how um new age spirituality um relates to theological you know a christian healing mm. it seems to run very parallel to it but there's so many so much so many similarities mm. yeah i think it's a really good question karen thank you for raising it um we'll probably touch a little bit more on this next week and i'm just aware of the time i i could talk about this all afternoon um but it's, it's just really interesting and i think scientifically um, there's been a lot of work around touch therapy, energy fields, Reiki, the psychological impact of listening to somebody, so the listening therapies, sort of science and psychology will give you an explanation of what's happening in our brains when that's happening. The simple process of being listened to, of getting in touch with our bodies. I think um, a lot of the time, stress and trauma can become trapped in our bodies. Um, and that sounds quite radical, but I know when I get stressed, um, I was saying to Catherine, my email failed yesterday, my shoulders were like this. I was so stressed and my back started hurting straight away. So my psychological stress went straight to my body. So it's not too new agey to say that stress gets trapped in our body. Um, and one and ways to release that are things that new age spirituality might promote, like singing, um, like smells with aromatherapy, but touch. So it helps us ways that science would recognize. Um, and as a Christian leading a Christian healing organization, I'm quite, I, I quite like loads of the new age stuff. I, I get massages when I can. It's one of the hard things about lockdown, all these other things. The difference needs to be where our eyes are pointed to, where we see the source of the, or of our spiritual power in our life as well. Whether it's, you know, and if we're centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, I work with a lot of people that, that do sort of listen, touch therapy uh, as Christians, but for them, and this is not something I'm gifted with, but for them, when I ask them about that, they say, well, my intention is always to share the love of God with what I'm doing. So I think a lot of it depends around the intention of the person. Um, and I can see Michael's got his hand up again, and maybe this is the last last one, because we said, say we said we'd end at 12. And anything else, do email me. Michael. Well, this, this is just very quick. It's just something that occurred to me. You know, when it comes to healing ministry, um we know what we know i mean jillian you know what you know um and we know what we don't know and and that's why a bunch of us are on this call because there's stuff we don't know and we think you know something that we don't know but there's also a lot about healing that we don't even know we don't know and i i, I think that's part of what we're we're dealing with i think about you know healing like mount healing or healing mountain 
and you know this call today and last week um it's like together we've climbed that mountain a little higher but that mountain is uh, a mountain with no top we'll never get to the top of all there is to know about healing that, well that what more can i say <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to end there's a lovely story i think heidegger who was one of the guys involved in early quantum theory he talked about that, finding out the mystery of the universe as climbing a mountain, Michael. And he said, we'll climb this mountain and we'll get to the top and we'll discover the theologians have been waiting for us for the last two thousand years to get up there. And I think that's a quotation. It's a good one to end with. Um, so, Kath, I'll just hand over to you for the... Wonderful. Well, thank you. The, uh, that's a beautiful way to end. I think the thing that I will take away is that word that this is our vocation for all of us. This is our vocation to keep exploring, keep... Um, speaking about uh, healing and exploring it and the vocation of the church and it must be it must be um, part of our story so Gillian so much you have given us to think about I think I speak on behalf of everybody when I say a massive thank you for your energy and your um, your your passion this morning and we have a two-week break so we so we meet again not next Wednesday but the week after and uh, if there's any prior reading it will come to you by email beforehand and can I just say thank you to every single one of you and just hold obviously any stories you've heard to yourselves um, and, and may you have a blessed rest of the day. Thank you for, for being with us on this journey. Hi everyone. Thanks, Kat.